Hello YouTube, Flight Sim Guy here. Uh, today I'm gonna make my first flight in the L1011, Captain Sims L1011. I'm at Indianapolis. I'm gonna go to my home airport of Port Columbus. Short flight, about 210 miles, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give this thing a shot. Uh, forewarned, it's gonna be ugly. Usually my first flight in these planes are, you know, particularly disastrous. But it'll be a good learning experience. Okay, so as far as my weight goes, I have 150 passengers, 9,600 pounds of cargo, which is pretty light for this bird. This thing can haul quite a bit. 37,000 pounds of fuel. We're going to be cruising at flight level 250. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right. All right, so here we are. Um, I have here this checklist. If you look in the, uh, the video notes, I went ahead and included it. I downloaded it from avsim.com. It's uh, pretty extensive. And what I'm going to do is uh, use this to help guide uh, the process. All right, so the first thing I want to do is fire up the aircraft. Actually, I don't need to fire up the aircraft to get an ATIS. So let's just go ahead and do that. Alright, pretty good ATIS there. Let's go ahead and uh, do that so we're not interrupted. As you can uh, hear, a lot of planes are taking off. Probably that one right there. And all the action is down here. Okay, I digress. Alright, so um, let me go ahead. This is what I'm going to do, okay? I'm going to go ahead and set this thing up get it ready for flight then I'll run through the checklist see if I miss anything all right so come over to the flight engineer station first thing we want to do is turn on battery master and next thing we want to do is get the APU going okay AP is going all fuel pumps are on let's see here uh, we're not ready to start the engine yet, so let's go ahead and leave the uh, flight engi engineer station. Let's come over here. All right, we are cruising at flight level 250. Uh, where is that thing? You have got to be kidding me. Jeez. All the way over here. Why do why they do that? Armed it afterwards. Okay, why is this thing shaking? Hmm, whatever. I checked the performance tables. We're going to be climbing out at 157. Just go ahead and dial this in here. And the engine on this thing is pretty powerful. I uh, guess I'll do that afterwards. Okay, I'm going to be flying it manually to uh, cruising altitude anyway. Let's see here. We're not using this. We're, done, we're gonna do strictly VOR to VOR navigation, which means uh, nav one needs to be one one two point zero. Oh man, nav two is all the way over here. Jesus, criminy. Okay, we'll go ahead and dial one one zero point six over here, and it's already there. Huh. A remarkably convenient. Okay. All right. Let's do some flows. We're gonna go ahead and set our transponder to uh, there. We go. Oops. There we go. And these are the radios. Everything is fine here. Uh, can we go ahead and set our set our trims already set for takeoff? And uh, we'll set the flaps uh, once we start the engines. 
And as far as EPR, I haven't been able to find any um, any uh, performance uh, data with regards to EPR settings. The engine of this thing is pretty powerful. Uh, thrust thrust to weight ratio is almost two to one. So, which means this thing can almost climb vertically. So, I'll just go ahead and leave it at 1.6. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the overhead, see if we need to do anything here. These systems are all for monitoring your uh, flight, con uh, flight surfaces. Um, Anti-skid. I'll come back and check all of this stuff after I start the engines. Okay. And start. These are your... Uh, anti-icing systems. Temperature is not too bad. 19 degrees and there's no precipitation. Alright. And next, let's go back to the flight engineer station, see if we're missing anything here before engine start. Okay. Okay, that's your APU right there. Okay, cool. And the inverters aren't on. Okay, that's fine. All right. What I'm going to do next is let's go ahead uh, and get the engine started, and then we'll call for our runway assignment. All right. So to do the engine start, fuel pumps are all on. There. Hydraulic systems is off, and over here, what I need to do is I need to turn on some bleed air first. There we go. There we go. And over here, what I need to do is turn off the bleed. to the packs so that the bleed air can go ahead and uh, go to the engines. All right, now I'm 100% I'm sure I'm skipping a ton of stuff, but what I'm gonna do is get the engine started and then come through to a complete rundown of the checklist. All right, I want to say I'm ready to go as far as starting the engines. So, park and brake is set. Engines are down, these are off. Let's get going, we'll start with engine number three. There we go. We'll wait until this hits about 20. Right there. All right, we've got a good start on engine number three. Let's do engine number two. Okay, it's spooling up. Wait until this hits 20. Good start on engine number two. Let's do engine number one. Good start on engine number one. We'll let everything settle down. Let's do our post startup activities. Um, barometers 2978. Let's go ahead and set that. 2978. There we go. Let's go ahead and set flaps. We want flaps 10. And the trim is already set. Okay, let's go back to the flight engineer station. Let's go ahead and restore bleed air to the packs. Turn on our hydraulics. And uh, let's double check to make sure we have juice 
going to the system, so we need to go to the electrical panel. Generator 1, 2, and 3 are producing juice. So is the APU. We can go ahead and kill the APU. Alright. Come back over here. What's this thing complaining about? Electrical system. Okay. Alright, turning off the APU master switch did that, and we have the anti-skid which is still on. And I totally should have turned on these lights. We'll go ahead and turn these on, turn on the taxi lights. Go ahead and turn on the logo lights also. Anti-skid is on. On. Okay, maybe you need to release the parking brake first. We'll look into that in a second. Alright, so, I think I'm ready to go. All I need to do now is run through the checklist. Oh, uh, actually, I'm not ready to go. How could I miss this? Um, flat director. There and there. Now, let's take a look at this autopilot. How the hell do you turn this thing on? Push come to shove, I'll fly this thing manually if I can't figure it out. I want to say this is it. Yep, that's probably it. Uh, but just to be safe, I can look it up. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Alright, just as I thought, this is the autopilot. I've never actually tested this thing in flight, so I'm probably going to screw it up. But I'll experiment anyways. Alright, so let's go ahead and go through the checklist. And I'm going to go ahead and read things off and um, attend to something if it's missing. Okay, what's this thing saying here? Autopilot disconnect. That's fine. Alright, let's run through the checklist real fast. Alright, parking brake is set. Battery is on. We're not using external power. INS, we are not using. Windshield heat. Uh, is off, not needed. Exterior lights are on. Air data sensor heat is off. Anti skid is off. Fasten seat belt and no smoking sign. How could I have missed that? That, I think, is right here. And emergency lights needs to be armed. There we go. Transponder is set. Throttle is closed. Flaps is set. Fuel quantity. That's a good one. Let's check the fuel quantity. We have 10, 10, 10, 10. Almost 40,000 pounds, which is exactly what I put in there. Cross field valves are open. I want to say they're closed. But we want to leave them the way they are. Fuel pumps are all on. APU is started, uh, APU is shut down, high pressure valve, engine isolation valves, cross bleed, pack flow is on, cabin pressurization. Um, I do need to set the cabin pressurization. Let's see here now, that's over here. What I need to do is right here, altitude set, cabin pressure control. We want to set at... 6,000 feet should be fine. Barometer set. Yep, that's right. And that's all good right there. It's cabin altitude. Set to the barometer 2.9. Seven, eight. There we go. All right. Okay, we're not using the INS. Overhead panel is good. Anti skid, I'll check when I uh, start taxiing. External lights are on. Emergency lighting and standby power, that's set. 
Seat belts and no smoking is on. Auto flight system has been checked and set. Flight instruments. Let's go ahead and confirm. Come outside. Yep, this is all good. Altimeter has been set. Landing gear is down. Parking brake is set. Throttles are closed. Fuel and ignition. That's all good. Radios, radar, transponder is good. Uh, I haven't set the weather radar. I'll do that when I'm cruising. Uh, fuel quantity has been set. Fuel panel is good. Okay, the engines have been started. Uh, I restored hydraulic pumps. All right, I am ready to go. So let's go ahead and call. And we are going to the east. All right, let's go ahead and set this to our climb out speed, which is going to be about 160. Okay. All right, shift P. Run our progressive taxi. Taxi. As you can see, I use the Eastern livery. Eastern was a big proponent of the L1011. Just look at that. Ain't that a beautiful thing? All right, let's start our taxi. Alright, we'll just pick up the uh, taxi lines down there. Do that. Alright, so let's talk about the big news in the world of fl flight simulation this week. Dovetail Games said, To hell with it, we are shutting down Flight Sim World. Engine vibration, yeah, whatever. And, you know, there was all sorts of mixed reactions um, in the community about that. PMDG just went off on them big time. It appears uh, PMDG and a bunch of people, a bunch of uh, folks who wanted to buy a licensing uh, right from Microsoft to continue developing the FSX code and Dovetail outbid them. So yeah, uh, PMDG was like, you know, you should have dead. <laughs> kind of sort of applauding their failure. Everybody else was saying, well, it's a crappy sim and blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. What I was saying, and I sent Dovetail a nice uh, three to five page uh, paper telling them essentially what they should do. And um, they didn't listen or they didn't do anything that I suggested, which is fine. I mean, you know, I was just uh, stating my opinion. What they did instead was to go ahead and develop the simulator uh, in-house, all the custom features, you know, making like a game and everything. And I applaud them for that. However, from the start, it was clear as day that that was going to be a, uh, a commercial failure simply because there's too many sims in the market. FSX, FSX Team, even FS9, they're all hanging on, you know, for dear life. And what the hell happened to my taxi lines? Where the hell am I supposed to go? So, yeah, um... Everybody was like, you know, uh, so yeah, they, they, they wanted to develop everything in-house. And what I told them in my paper, in the, in the, the, the paper that I sent them was, was simple. You need to buy your way into the market. The, uh, the barriers to entry in flight simulation is really, really high, primarily because it is such a complicated, uh, you know, software. I mean, you know, flight simulation is complicated. All right, where the hell am I? Where do I need to go? That's where I need to go. Okay. Yeah, I was telling Dovetail they need to buy into the market. What that means is they have the core sim engine or the you know the core uh, simulator code base. But for the longest while, they didn't have any weather. They didn't have any uh, AI traffic. They didn't have half the stuff that you know ten-year-old FSX had. So I was saying, look, you need to you know raise some capital and spend some money. Approach Traffic 360 and say, hey, let's do a deal. I want to license your code. Bam. Your traffic uh, 
question is solved. Approach Dino Catania. Hey, I want some Navy uh, uh, aircraft. Bam. Your Navy aircraft question is solved. There is a package called AI Carriers out there that's free, but you want to be all legit. So find the author and make him an offer. I want to include AI Carriers as part of the code base in Flight Sim World. And there you have Navy Operations, Lock, Stock, and Barrio. Approach Active Sky. Hey, I want to license your software for weather. Bam! Your weather question is solved. You don't have to develop it in house. In other words, all the cool features that all the simulators have, instead of trying to develop it in house and release it uh, as updates year over year, just go ahead and find somebody who's already done it and incorporate it. Because remember, ooh, that looks good right there. Oh man, look at that. That is so friggin' sweet. Remember, the code base of Flight Sim World is, you know, Microsoft code. A lot of the stuff can be adapted with a, without a lot of uh, changes. Um, what else? Uh, I don't know. All the cool add-ons that we buy to make our simulator experience more enjoyable. Uh, the folks at Dovetail should have approached them behind the scenes and make them an offer. Try to roll them in rather than build, building it yourself. Personally, in my opinion, even then, I think... Flight Sim World would have failed anyway because our community is very small, it's a niche community and there were simply too many flight simulators uh, for uh, uh, too many flight sims, not enough simmers. But I applaud them for their attempt and uh, you know I enjoyed playing Flight Sim World a few times I flew it. Um, no. And there are plenty of uh, mom and pop shop add-ons out there. The guy that does uh, level uh, level D seven sixty seven, I think, it's a one guy shop. Um, who else? Uh, Leonardo, uh, the Mad Dog. What Dovetail should have done was identify all these mom and pop, uh, you know, small outfits, make them an offer, and bundle them into the Flight Sim World uh, product. If they'd gotten the best add-ons, I want to say that could have. Uh, you know, stolen a lot of customers uh, away from the other sim platforms, and they, they could be holding off for life. Now, having said that, you know, you keep bringing people in, it's going to chip away at your profit margin. But then again, they weren't making any money to begin with, so you had nothing to lose. I thought that was a risk-free approach. So that's what I was telling them. I'm like, look, don't try and do this yourself. You know, raise money, go to a bank, borrow capital. And approach these other developers out there, make them offers, and try and get them into your uh, your environment. So, but anyway, personally, I I think that X Plane 11 and P3D version 4.0 was just simply too much. All right, here's our runway. Okay, let's review. The takeoff briefing. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to fly runway heading 230. Uh, we're going to go ahead and climb straight to uh, 25,000 feet. But after takeoff, at about 1,000 feet, we are going to come left. Do we want left? It doesn't really matter. We're going to come left to heading 108 to intercept the SHB VOR at 112.0. What we probably should do is come down here and move that out of the way. We want, there we go, VOR 1. We'll turn off the marker beacon. Anti-skid. Let's see if I can get that to work this time. Alright, these are your heats. Let's go ahead and turn these on. Anti-skid is over here. There we go. Okay, so it only works when, you're, uh, when your brake isn't holding. Eh, whatever. 
I don't plan to abort my takeoff anyway. All right. Let's go through the before takeoff checklist. Wow, this checklist is very extensive. Okay, before takeoff. Uh, it says continuous ignition on. I don't think I need it. Ignition selector, both exterior lights, transponder. Let's go ahead and set our lights. We want to turn on those and turn this off. And let's go ahead and call. Gonna hand flight. There we go. Position and hold. And then once I'm stable at cruise, I'll go ahead and make an attempt to work with the autopilot. Alright, we're good to go. Let's go ahead and start the clock. And I hate this clock. Okay, so we took off at uh, 11.15. Let's go. I'm going to make a left turn to 108. Alright. So now we are set to take off. Is not cooperating. Rotate. I told you this was going to be ugly. Tap the brakes. Positive rate. Gear up. All right, let's get up. All right, let's come back off the gas. Flaps up one. We already have. There we go. All right. Let's go ahead and make our left turn. Keep climbing. And I really wish this wasn't all the way over here. That's our heading right there. And I can. Oh, there we go. All the throttle is on. Let's go ahead and bring it up to 250. There we go. And let's move this up to 250. Alright, let's keep turning. Now we're pretty close to that VOR station, so this needle is going to have a hard time uh, staying still. Laps up. All the way up. All right. The next freak is one oh one one zero point six. Let's go ahead and uh, where's the DME on this damn thing? 
Uh, that's the course. Where's my DME? Ah, there it is. 21 miles. Okay, cool. Yes. All right. That's fine. Come all the way over here. There we go. Still climbing. 6,000 feet. That's fine. I'm still too close to the ground right now to experiment with the autopilot. What I want to do is get up to cruise. There we go. We're on course. Um, let's see. Heading. In fact, I can screw with the autopilot right now. All I need to do... There it is right there. Okay. Heading. Indicated airspeed. All right. And arm that. All right. So the auto throttle is, or the uh, autopilot is set. Um, let's go ahead and do vertical speed. We can go a lot higher, faster than this. Take it up about 2,000 feet per minute. going higher? No, we're not. And I have it set on vertical speed. What's your problem here, buddy? Okay, let's go back to indicated airspeed. That's fine. Okay. Go ahead and switch to... What the hell are these controls all the way over here? Damn it. Approach localizer. What is that? Nav? Yep, nav. That's all we want. Actually, I'll go ahead and do nav later. Heading. There we go. 110.6 is the next station. So let's go ahead and dial that in. 110.6. 110.6. And heading 080 is what we want. Right about there. Okay, what are we doing here? Heading. There we go. Alright, so... You're not flying the heading that I want. Just past 10,000 feet. Okay, auto throttle is off. Turn on, man. Let's try vertical speed. There we go. All right, learning things about the auto throttle. Okay, heading, cycle heading. It's not following the heading. Okay, so. Lateral navigation isn't working for whatever reason. Um, I am picking up the uh, the next VOR station, which is good. So let's go ahead and fine tune that. Uh, we need to be flying that heading. All right. Let's see here. Okay, this is my vertical profile stuff. Localizer approach and uh, nav. Let's try that. All right. There we go. We're turning. And I can increase my speed. 270. Let's see. Can I screw with the vertical speed here? Yes, I can. All right. So it's not following the course as it, as it should. Both flight directors are on. Okay, they are they're on now. <laughs> Maybe I need to turn on both autopilots. There we go. Okay, what did I just do? That is CMD. Okay, cool. All right. Wow, this is pretty sweet. Ain't that a beautiful thing? Look at that. Look at that. Oh, man, that is so sexy. This is by far the sexiest um, aircraft I've flown. Uh, the Mad Dog is still my favorite, though. I uh, don't think I'm cheating on the Mad Dog. Alright, I gotta watch my airspeed. Um, I'm still in vertical. 
I'm still in VS mode. Let's go to indicated airspeed. And turn this right here. And well, localizer. Alright, let's experiment for a second here. Let's see if we're still in heading. Okay, we're still in heading. There we go. It's not taking commands from the localizer. Let's see here now. Ah, there we go. Click nav. Alright, that's better. And we are 41 miles away from the SHB VOR station. Okay, you should be straightening up now, and she is. Oh, wow, look at that. Air speed is still good. Wow, this is actually a lot of fun. Okay. All right. So, one of the most notorious uh, accidents involving the L-1011. Uh, it's the first link of the notable accidents in the description below. Uh, Eastern L-1011 was coming in to land in Miami, and it was uh, making its approach from the Everglades. And the captain gave the order gear down. Well, it gave gear down, but the middle light didn't come on. The other lights did, but the middle light didn't come on, and they were like... You know, is the gear down or, or what? And they're like, well, we don't know. So everybody in the cockpit is trying to figure out if the nose gear wheel is down. Okay? And they're like, well, it could be a, a blown bulb. Well, let's get the bulb out and you know, try and see if it's blown or whatever. And the pilot, everyone was fix, fixated on this light. They're like, you know what? Let's go ahead and uh, set the autopilot 2,200 feet. They told ATC, we're going invest, to investigate this blown bulb this blown bulb business and and they're there working on it and everything and the pilot says to the flight engineer go downstairs uh, I guess I can go down in the thing to see if the gear is down and while he turned to tell the flight engineer to go do that he bumped the column well the L-1011 was designed that if you give any sort of input into the yoke it disconnects the autopilot and nobody heard the autopilot disconnecting so while they were there trying to figure out if the gear was down the plane started losing altitude and nobody was paying attention this was before crew resource before crew resource management and wouldn't you know it by the time they discovered that you know <laughs> they were circling and about to crash. It was too late. They gave it gas, but the plane plunged into the Everglades. And there's a relatively brand new L-1011 too. It's only like three months old. Now, there have been many, many accidents where the cause was pilot error, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Okay? What makes this accident special is that Eastern, after they got done with the recovery effort, since it was a relatively new plane, they recycled a lot of the parts in uh, other L-1011s, the spare parts. And soon afterwards, people started reporting ghosts and images of the crew of the original L-1011 that uh, crashed, those people that died. People started reporting ghosts, you know, showing up on these other planes where the spare parts was being used. And obviously, the executives at Eastern was like, oh, give me a break. This is so stupid. And they quietly removed all the spare parts that were being used. So, uh, interesting story, true story, and this is just one of those things where, you know, people weren't paying attention, and they crashed a perfectly good aircraft. Alright, so we're coming into some turbulence here. Uh, we're at 270 knots. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. We're passing 22,000 feet. We're still climbing, and according to this, our engine power setting, we have plenty of juice left. Now, this is a little bit, let me see if I can straighten this out here. There we go. We, ha we still have uh, plenty of juice left. I mean, f from an EPR perspective, you know, we're nowhere near max.
Okay, my flaps are up. Still looking good. All right, so uh, SHB, the next VOR station is RID. Let's go ahead and tune that in. Uh, which is no, no, no. I am at RID. The next one is DQN, which is Dayton one one four point five. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch our heading there, and we're gonna go to heading. Okay, I'm sure that's not supposed to be. There we go. One one four point five. There we go. Uh, let's go ahead and tune. Man, it just kills me that the course needle is all the way over here. Okay, so there we go. Nope, that's not right. There we go. There we go. Uh, zero fifty-five. Okay, that's right. And let's go ahead and turn. 055. Like so. And we're making our bank. Leveling off at 25,000 feet. And we can go back to localizer. And we are 28 miles from that VOR station. Okay. Let's go ahead and fine tune. There we go. And we need to back off. Turn that on. And we'll just settle in at 280. Okay, what are we doing here? Okay, that's good. Set this to 80, which is about right there. Alright. And according to this, I've only been flying for 15 minutes. Huh. It took a lot longer than that. All right. So we're going to Dayton, and I'm going to Columbus. Dayton is only 60 miles away. So in reality, I should be uh, starting my descent. Because uh, then the next VOR station is Ape 116.7. You know what? Let's just do a direct to 116.7. So let's go ahead and turn this off. Go back to heading. 116.7 which is ape there we go and let's go ahead and fine tune that right there 090 let's go ahead and make the turn and hit the localizer and we're still holding at 25 flat level 250 all right see here there we go all right zero nine zero perfectly lined up 97 miles all right so the ape I have to use the ape VOR station which is according to the map it's about 20 miles to the northeast of Port Columbus. Port Columbus doesn't have a VOR station on field. This is the closest one. And according to this weather, it's looking pretty good out there. So what I'm going to have to do is the weather is pretty good. So this is the plan. We're going to go ahead and uh, proceed direct to the Ape VOR. And um, the minimum safe altitude for Port Columbus is... Let's go ahead and look that up. 3,100 feet, which is, Columbus is 900, so it's 3,100, so it's about 4,000, 4,000 feet above, uh, uh, 4,000 feet, uh, on this thing. <laughs> oh, wow, I've been drinking. All right, so, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, look at that. All right. The point I'm trying to make is this is going to be strictly a, um, visual thing. Alright, so the ATIS for Port Columbus is 124.6. Let's go ahead and get an ATIS, 124.6. We should be uh, close enough. There we 
go. Alright, so what we're going to do, we need to come on down. Alright, so to do that, let's go ahead and dial in 4,000 feet. We just go straight down to 4,000. Actually, no. Let's go to 10,000 first. Okay. Arm. And... Vertical speed. Dial this back. To about 260. And then we're going to do vertical speed. Okay, is this down? 2200. Wow, this plane is a. It's actually. It's easy to fly and it's fun to fly. Alright, so we're coming down at 2100 feet. The plan is once we hit the Ape VOR, we're gonna uh, turn south to heading. Uh, 189 and then we'll uh, do a visual approach uh, to whatever runway we're gonna get we're gonna land on all right let's go ahead and set our arriving barometer 2969 I never did set uh, standard which is fine 2969 and let's come over to the pressurization which is over here um, 2969 the hell is it Ah, here. Our uh, pressure was good. 2969, that's our landing. 2969. Yeah, that's fine. And we were at 6,000 cabin pressure, which is good. Let's take a look at our fuel. Where's the fuel? Oh, yeah, we got plenty of fuel. This one here is lower primarily because I'm pretty sure that's where the APU is drawing fuel from. We'll go ahead and fire up the APU once we are on the ground. Also, folks, as a reminder, this entire uh, flight engineer station is fully functional. Fully modeled and fully functional. And I really like the fluorescent lamps. Very nice touch. Okay, what's this? 18,000 feet. Um, our speed is good. Coming down good. We're still on course. 49 miles out from Ape, which means we should be flying directly over date. Let's go ahead and bring the throttle back. Uh, and I need to look at my landing speed. Let me go ahead and... Uh reference my document, my performance charts. Alright, so we're at 36,000 pounds. So our landing speed is 130... 144... 36. What am I doing? 144 at flaps 33. Alright, we're at 33 miles out. I keep coming down. So we have a look on the outside. Alright, here's the Springfield Air National Guard, which means right pat should be back over here somewhere. Ow! No! This is um <laughs> here's Port Columbus. What the hell am I saying? And here is um OSU Airport. Wow! That was a lot faster than I thought. Oh my goodness. What's my status? 8,000 feet and we're at 26 miles from Ape. Okay, because we're going to have to fly way past the airport to come around. Can't believe I didn't recognize my own backyard. And here's uh, Columbus and Bolton is down here. Alright, we're in a good position. By the time we get to Ape, we'll be, uh, we'll be where we need to be. So let's go ahead and call and get our runway assignment.
Two nine or six nine or right one way. Two eight right. Okay. Uh, you know what? I won't be able to see when I need to make my turn. So let's go ahead and get the ILS just to be safe. Two eight right is one oh nine point one. Here's Port Columbus. Now the Port Columbus scenery that I bought from uh, some market, uh, the guy that developed that one also did boat and field. It looks good, but it ha it's loaded with bugs. If you try parking at any of the gates, you'll get a, get a collision. Say it's a turn off collision. And the, uh, the lighting system to the runways are totally jacked up. Alright, we are way too fast, so let's uh, slow down. About nine zero, and our landing speed. What did I say my landing speed was? One forty-four. All right. Whoa, we are not stopping. Okay. Did I not arm it? I thought I did. Okay, we need to get back to 4100. And let's just go ahead and turn off the auto throttle. I'll just fly this manually. Okay, let's go ahead and push the nose down. At this point, folks, we are hand flying this. Alright, there we go. Okay, how far are we? We are 10 miles. All right, so keep it right there, and I need to move this to 144. It's going to be my landing speed. It's about right there. Okay, 109.1. Alright folks, at this point I'm hand flying the aircraft. Gotta watch my altitude. This aircraft is designated heavy, so Okay, okay we're five miles. Okay, Port Columbus is way back there. One and it's runway two eight. Okay. 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 I'm not sure what that is. I'll turn it off. All right. Three miles. One oh nine point one. Let's go ahead and do it. slope right here. I'm going to fly out a little bit longer until this comes up some more. That'll give me more room to correct any errors. Okay, I'm about 15 miles away from the airport. I'm still way below the ILS. So that's good. I'll fly the ILS, but I'm not going to use the autopilot. Okay, can I see the airport? Nope. So that thought. Too far. Alright. Let's go ahead and fly an insert. Another plane coming in. 
if I don't collide with him. Okay, that noise, folks, is uh, my constantly screwing up my uh, altitude. All right. Okay, all I need to do is watch my needle. Once it starts drifting to the middle, make a left turn to 280. I will use the autopilot to do an ILS approach another time. This time I'm going to I'm just going to go ahead and hand fly it. Now the aircraft is yawing a little bit. It has to do with these uh, engine throttle controls. These SciTech yokes things, they get dirty. Alright, those guys are going in. I should probably just follow them. And as a result, they're just all over the place. Alright, so I'm getting into the ILS. I don't want to come in too high because this is a big bird. Alright, those are the planes right there. Let's go ahead and... Let's go ahead and follow them in. And there's the airport right there. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Here's my runway right there. Alright. Let's go ahead and start making my turn. Gear coming down. Now the notch of flaps. On the edge of stalling. I don't think DLC has kicked in yet. Okay, there it is right there. Okay. I can't see what flap setting I'm at. Damn it. Oh, I've got a couple more notches. Alright, I'm too high. There's my runway. <clears throat> okay, another notch of flaps. Now, DLC can mess you up if it's not implemented properly. And I don't think it's working on this one. There's a runway. I'm still too high. Okay, now I shouldn't stall because my nose is pointed down quite a bit. Whoa, dude! Get out of my way. <laughs> okay, here's my flap settings. I think I have one more notch. According to the uh, L1011 manuals, they don't use flap setting 44. Okay, I don't want to screw this up, so... Okay, is that me? Nope, not me. And these speeds are obviously off. There we go. Okay, surface elevation at Columbus is about 900 feet. So I gotta watch my altitude. Okay, I'm on the ILS. Ooh, parallel landing, dude! Nice! All I have to do is not screw this up. Okay, I did lower my gear, didn't I? Yes, I did. And I have... God damn it. Better not crash on me. Okay, one more notch of flaps. Okay, 
is DLC in? No, it's not. All right, that's fine. Well, I don't need DLC messing up my landing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Light flow. Light flow. Okay, I don't want to bark. I don't want to do a go around here. Okay, now I am too high. Shut up! And there is that scurry lighting I was telling you about. Alright, so that was by far not the prettiest landing I've ever done. But all things considered, I'll take what I can get. Alright! Oh wow, that landing is gonna look horrible! Alright. <sighs> yeah, that wasn't the best landing in the world, but... You know? Um, I'll take it. And one thing you have to remember about the L-1011 is, it's about, um, how many stories high? It's about maybe three or four stories uh, tall so you gotta be careful you know when you touch down you definitely want to use your radio altimeter which I didn't turn on to be sure there's a switch for it and we'll stop right here and there you have it ladies and gentlemen my first flight in the Captain Sim Lockheed L-1011. I have another L-1011 that is just flight. I'm going to have to try that one out also. But before I get to that, I'm going to take this one more flight to the east. Um, I'm trying to think if I should go to New York or uh, D.C. Probably go to D.C. It's another one-hour flight east. And uh, that'll give me more time to get familiar with this aircraft. But that was a lot of fun. Uh, that side-by-side uh, -side dual landing. Uh, don't get to do that every day in, uh, when you're simming. And that's all I have. Hope you guys found this video useful. My name is Flight Sim Guy. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.